Good afternoon to you. Mark Sot of HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Thursday, the 22nd of June, 2023, and we have a big update today. The Atlantic dominating for now. Very interesting, very historic. Really, it is what's happening out there. And just think about it. We've got Brett, a name storm of TD4. That's a tropical cyclone as well. So two tropical cyclones, by definition, east of the Lesser Antilles in the month of June, we have never seen anything like that before. Let's break it down, talk about what it means, talk about the effects, the impacts from Brett for our friends down there in the islands and a few other topics as well. All right, good to have you join me. Now let's get started. First, a tweet here just reiterating what I said from Dylan Federico. He knows a lot about the tropics, believe me, so follow him. You won't be disappointed. Very straight to the point. And this is it. I mean, he, he says it great. We're witnessing history in the Atlantic. Having two storms east of the islands in June is unprecedented. Two tropical cyclones there. Whether or not TD4 becomes Cindy, and I think it will, doesn't really matter. I know the public would see it as, oh, Brett and Cindy, but it is two tropical cyclones. We do have them at the same time out there in the eastern Atlantic, and that is a pretty big deal. It really is. Looking at it from the precipitable water perspective, there's Brett, there's TD4, maybe Cindy later today. We shall see. Lots of moisture down here in the intertropical convergent zone, even another tropical wave kind of trying to rotate there. The blues and purples up here, that is your dry air. Yes, it's not real prevalent. There's enough, though, that these systems aren't just going to the uh, off to the races. You know, it is still June, and climatology, dry air, and other issues are luckily keeping both of these features, Brett and TD4, from strengthening very quickly. But the very warm water relative to average, Brett and Cindy are taking advantage of that in here roughly. And yeah, these water temperatures are running almost a degree to two degrees Celsius warmer than the 30-year average. So what does it look like on the track map? Well, let's zoom in and get you guys ready down here for what to expect. Of course, remember, Brett is not a cute little tropical storm symbol. It's a much larger weather feature than that. It's not a little dot with an S in it. It's not a line, and it is not a cone. It is a big weather system that will be bringing heavy rain. And I'm going to zoom in in a minute. I'm going to show you some of the topography. Of what's what I like about this map here, our interactive map off the Hurricane Track Insider site, available to all of our patrons, by the way. Um, rainfall could be a real big problem here, and that is the primary threat from any tropical cyclone. When you hear tropical cyclone, I want you to unlearn wind and think more water, whether it be rain or storm surge. The wind is important, no doubt about it, but I'm not as worried about the wind in these islands down here. These houses are built, most of the businesses down there, for wind. Most places are. Some aren't. I understand that. But rainfall, hey, water made the Grand Canyon. I think it can mess up your property. So let's zoom in and we'll talk about it a little bit more looking at the topography down here. And you can just tell from what we call the relief on these maps here. It's a geographic thing. Yeah, there are some hills and mountains down here. Uh, some of them um, a thousand meters. We're talking 3,000 feet or higher. All right, so that rainfall gets focused goes down those gullies or washes or guts or whatever you call them locally and that can focus down on villages and towns below and become a really big problem. Even just focusing at a few hundred feet down a hillside into a, a busy city street or a village street or whatever the case may be can be lethal. Moving water really can be a problem so please think of Brett and you guys that live down there and you've been there a long time you know maybe you're new maybe you're visiting Rain is your biggest enemy with this. Yes, the winds could get gusty. Yes, there could be some problems with power outages, stuff getting blown around, some damage, trees down, that kind of thing. But I look at this as a big rain problem overall. And why not? Look at it. It's huge compared to these islands, right? That is a ton of moisture, a lot of moisture coming. I showed you that on the precipitable water animation. This is what it looks like on a close-up satellite view. Closing in the whole package there. And look, that doesn't look like a cute little dot with arms. That's a huge weather system. Now, it's not particularly well organized, which is a good thing, but that doesn't matter. It's still going to bring a lot of rainfall, and it could bump up again in terms of intensity as it's coming in. You just never know. 
and you could translate some of those gustier winds down to the surface as an example. So, you know, don't discount it, but no, it's not the worst thing ever unless you get flooded out. And then it is the worst thing ever potentially for you. And that's how I want you to think about these weather systems. How will they impact me? It's okay to be selfish in those situations. There's Barbados. Here's Guadalupe just to give you an idea. This will be passing through that general area over the next several hours. Maybe some lightning and thunder with some of the <clears throat> more prevalent thunderstorms if they get going, especially since there is some dry air involved. You do get thunderstorms more in the bands, but it's going to be an interesting time coming up. You guys let us know, especially if you're watching from down there on YouTube. Tell me how it is in the comments, as they say. We're all very curious. Now let's move to the east. Look at TD number four, probably on its way to becoming Cindy. Now look at this. It's interesting. The upper level winds and the flow kind of pushing a bulk of the deep thunderstorms west of the low level center of TD4. But some deep thunderstorms trying to develop near that center might be just enough if there is some scatterometer data that comes in from satellites or maybe some ship reports you never know that this gets upgraded at the 5 p.m. advisory time. But backing out to the wider shot again, really remarkable to see Brett here, TD4, maybe Cindy here, other features in the intertropical convergence zone. Not much chance of these developing. And finally, a little bit of African dust starting to come off of Africa. That might help to tamp things down just a little bit because they have certainly been very, very active as of late. All right, let's look at the modeling real quick. This is the 5,000 foot level. And just to show you the humidity level right here, 700, 300 millibar moisture. Yes, they have a little bit of moisture to work with, both of our systems, but there's still a pretty good amount of mid-level dry air in the region. And that's just part of climatology. You just normally see that out there. That is why, one of the reasons anyway, we don't have hurricanes in the main development region in the month of June. And by the way, let me go back over to the tracking map. I want to show you something really neat here that our uh, programmer put in for us. There's the MDR right there. Ha ha, isn't that cool? And we can even turn on the ENSO regions as well. Will Woodgate did such a great job with this. Both of those systems well within the main development region. Back to the modeling though, they might be in the MDR, but yes, you can still have that dry air. That's what the brown shows. So let's just move this out into time. Brett goes through the islands there. Uh, TD4 maybe becomes Cindy. And then Brett kind of weakens and you know, it seems to basically dissipate by about 48 hours out. Let's just back it up to that time frame. Let's go back to the lower part of the atmosphere, 5,000 feet. That doesn't look like very much. You know, I like that layer of the atmosphere. And I say, if it looks good there, everything else could be stacked up as well. So what's the problem? Well, there's not much moisture, that's for sure. It's kind of robbed of that. But let's go look up at the upper part of the atmosphere at 200 millibars. Ah, there's the clue. Let's open this separately, zoom in on it, and this tells you a lot. Look at that. Kind of a tut building in there, tropical upper tropospheric trough, if, if you will. And it's putting that dagger right through that system. Uh, there's TD4, maybe it would be Cindy, we'll see. It's on the east side of that upper level trough, so some shear waiting for it eventually, but that is probably why Brett succumbs to climatology right there. And normally you see a tut sitting out here this time of year, and especially in an El Nino year, so I'm not too worried about Brett making it all the way through and becoming an issue for Central America or elsewhere just yet. There's no reason to worry about it just yet. Um, I think the tut and the climatological factors are going to keep that from being a problem later on. But let's go back to the lower part of the atmosphere and just finish this out to a week's time. What's left of Brett does go into Honduras, Nicaragua, according to the GFS. And then what would be maybe Cindy, that's all that's left of it right there by about five days out. And again, let's just play detective. Why? Let's look at 200 millibars. It's not particularly uh, in an area of, of strong winds, so hard to say. Not the most ideal. GFS doesn't do much with it. Hey, we'll take it. We don't need any of that shenanigans now or ever, right? I, most people would agree, but certainly not in June. So I'm not too worried about these systems after Brett impacts the islands. There's just not much evidence to support worrying about them. So if you're in Florida, 
you're going to Cancun, you're going to Jamaica, yeah, maybe some passing rain or something like that down in the Caribbean, not for Florida, but nothing to worry about in terms of direct impacts later on. Meanwhile, in the Eastern Pacific, remember, this says for now, dominating for now. Eventually, the East Pack's going to come to life. Let's back it up to the current time frame. Nothing now, but watch what happens over the next few days. The westerly winds come in down at the lower levels. That's your convectively coupled Kelvin wave moving through, sparking things off, giving that extra kick. And then the energy takes over that is in the eastern Pacific. And voila, we get a tropical cyclone or two. Going to make up for lost time, I guess. We'll see about that second one down there, that smaller one. But potentially a very large, powerful hurricane could develop. We'll see. This is more than a week out now. But you can clearly see what happens. Just watch where we start now. Some of those westerly winds coming in. That's your CCKW, your convectively coupled Kelvin wave. It just reverses the low-level winds temporarily. Not like an El Nino does where it's you know pretty much for months and months at a time. Or the Madden-Julian oscillation, which could be a few weeks. This is generally temporary. And then the trades resume more to a normal fashion after it goes by. See? They're more normal there later on down the road, more than 10 days out or so. All right, back to this real quick. Speaking of El Nino, people were asking about that on the YouTube chat recently. Or not the chat, or the comments, sorry. There's the El Nino. Now let's talk about this for a second. Not every El Nino is the same. Some take longer to reach their peak. Some come on real strong, and then they die out real strong. They, there's, there's just never a textbook playbook for how ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation phenomena, whether it's the La Nina, the cold version, or the El Nino, the warm version, there's no one set of rules. So we look, we observe, and we see what's happening, we see some of the guidance, and we go from there. So again, talking about facts, here's what we know. The Pacific along the equatorial region has warmed, but it's not warming rapidly. And a lot of the more appreciable warmth is in the eastern Pacific. Meanwhile, as we've pointed out over and over again, the Atlantic up here really setting records for its warmth. Classic positive AMO look. We still have the cold Pacific Meridional mode or kind of a cold PDO look. And then a fairly warm area out here off of Mexico. So our storms that are probably going to develop through here should have some energy to work with. But the El Nino here not coming on really strong. And we are only a couple of months from the peak of the season getting here, and we're already dealing with two tropical cyclones. I find that to be very interesting, don't you? And furthermore, the subsurface warmth, if you took a slice of this right through here and said, what does that look like in the vertical? This would be it. The surface is up here, and you can see all those positive anomalies. The subsurface down here, Yes, ridiculous positive anomalies below about 50 meters, but you've got to have some kind of a mechanism to get that conveyor belt going, to basically get this to happen right here. That's the conveyor belt, so to speak. How do you get that to happen? You've got to have westerly winds west of all of this to kind of push the water and create a downwelling Kelvin wave. That's what we call it. And it gets that thing moving. Well, there's not much to even get moving. So once you've exhausted everything over on the east side over here, there's not a lot left to replace it. So I just don't see that we're going to have an overwhelming El Nino in time to shut off the Atlantic hurricane season. I could be wrong, but just looking at it from a logical perspective. Forget the forecast. Forget models. Just look at it. There's just not a, yeah. I mean, yeah, we got the El Nino, no doubt but there's not a lot left for it to become overwhelming. And you couple that with the fact, you just go back to this. I mean, come on, that is a lot to overcome. This is really, let me put it this way. You're gonna to have to see a lot more of this all the way out here to really start to shut this down. And the fact that we are not doing it in any kind of a hurry is kind of interesting. And finally, to wrap this up, at least getting there, the CFS V2 forecast, yeah, not quite as aggressive overall, kind of peaks it out and then drops it down by October or so. The models, and I said, yeah, don't always look at the models. No, but they are guidance, right? Some of them are split. 
colder solutions, warmer solutions. Even the models after the spring predictability barrier were in the summer and we're still having a huge spread in some of the guidance. In fact, I mean, I could go over that like in a, in a, in a, in a, in its, if I can talk, in its own update, the POAMA model from Australia, the ECMWF, the UK Met. We don't have time for that. Not here. I want to try to wrap this up. But even the modeling is all over the place. In fact, the Australian POAMA model, I saw this on Twitter yesterday, is predicting, I think, at least two Celsius above the long-term average in the Nino 3.4 area. And just to show you where that is, show off that map again from uh, Will Woodgate, that would be, if I can pull this back a little bit, this green area. This is your 3.4 region right through here. Poema model saying at least 2.0. I think it was like 2.8 or something was the peak. I don't remember. There's a lot of people like, what? Let's hope that's not going to happen because that would be awful for global weather ramifications. But yes, things are interesting because look at all these different blues on either side of the mean. That tells me there's a lot of uncertainty. All right. One thing that I am certain of, try to wrap this up and package this for you, so to speak, in a good way to pitch it. We do have some of these maps left. I was, uh, shipped out a few the other day. I actually put some 2022 maps in the tubes by accident, so a few of you may get last year's. I have rectified it, and I've already sent your 2023s today. Too much going on in my life sometimes. It's okay. Um, but yes, I still have a few of these left. They are beautiful. A big old poster-sized map. And uh, it's only 20 bucks, and that includes the shipping. I'm out of tubes, by the way, so I will have to send it flat in an envelope. I just fold it twice, and you just open it back up, and it'll be nice on your wall. Make sure you get a Sharpie, and you can plot, apparently, what is going to be a very busy season to go. So check out the link, hurricanetrack.com slash track map, all one word. I'll put it in the description, and you can order one for yourself or give it as a gift. And again, if you got one that says 2022 on it, I'm sorry, I goofed. It's okay. I just have to slow down sometimes. We all do, right? Right. All right. Again, thanks very much for tuning in. And by the way, by the way, see, I'm not even slowing down. Deep breath, Mark. By the way, I do appreciate the views, the comments, the interaction. 99% of it constructive, helpful, civil, you name it. I appreciate it very, very much. The fact that I can educate you and do this and share my passion with you really means a lot to me. So all the new folks that have signed up on YouTube, signed up, subscribed, whatever. I really am in too much of a hurry today, huh? Just a lot to talk about. I get excited about it. But I do appreciate it very much, the support on social media. We're most active on YouTube and Twitter, some Facebook, but those two platforms, YouTube and Twitter. From the heart, I appreciate your interactions and your support uh, just by watching the videos. All right. All right. Now let's get this on so then I can go catch my breath. You guys have a good rest of your Thursday. Hang in there down on the islands. We'll see what happens. We'll t uh, check in with that tomorrow. All right, I am Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com. And yes, we'll be back and we'll look at it all again tomorrow.